Hey everybody, it's Darcy. I hope you're doing well. Today is June 6th and uh, the 76th anniversary of D-Day. So please make sure you remember that. I actually had uh, three great uncles and a grandfather contributing uh, overseas at D-Day. Now today we're going to be talking about a cyanoprint. We're going to be doing one together. It's a really neat process. You may be more familiar with the term blueprint because it's the exact same thing. Now the quick history behind a blueprint, uh, you can imagine back in uh, prior to the 1860s when they were building a building, the main architect had one main drawing. But what happens, because they didn't have printers or photocopiers and couldn't make multiple prints by electronics like we can today, when they got on a job site, there would be the, the brick masons and the architects and the contractors and maybe the plumbing team. They all wanted a copy of the instructions of how they were to proceed on this building. So the main architect, he had his main plan in front of him all the time, but if somebody needed a copy, he couldn't give it out because it was only copy. So he, at the time, would literally have a small little army of junior architects who would spend their days recreating the original copy so that he could give them, the contractors, a copy so they wouldn't know what to do. Now, along came a gentleman named John Herschel in 1862, and he created a method by combining uh, two chemicals, and I'm just going to read them here, I have them in my hand. Uh, one is potassium ferric cyanide, and the other one is ferric ammonium citrate. Now I got these two here from Jacquard Products. They're not promoting the film. I really do like their products, mind you. But they're not promoting this at all. So what happens, he mixed two products which became a light sensitive solution. And when light hit the product, or the mixture or whatever, it would turn it blue. So they devised a way to take the original architectural design, throw it, put on uh, chemicals onto paper, throw it in the light with the uh, design on top, and it would create a blueprint. And that's how it all started. So all of a sudden it became really easy because if the main architect needed 15 different blueprints for 15 different contractors, rather than getting 15 different architects to recreate a big drawing, and it had to be exact, like this wasn't something they could do in five minutes, he would actually now create 15 different blueprints and hand them out, and they were an exact copy of the original. Now, today, unfortunately, with blueprints, I remember when I was in high school, and I know I'm older than everybody out there, but I remember in high school, we were starting just to get uh, color blotters, cutter, uh, color inkjet printers, and laser printers, but my high school actually still had a blueprint printing machine in architectural design class, and it was kind of neat, I actually made one. But today, really, we have AutoCAD, we have uh, photocopiers, we have staples, and Business Depot, and printers at our, at our whim right now. So, the process of blueprinting has actually now become more of an art form, and people are creating something called a cyanotype or a blueprint of an art or an art piece. These are the neat, there's a couple of neat things. A, it's an easy process. B, um, everyone is different. Everyone's unique because you're using, you're never using the very, very exact same, uh, same amount of sunlight twice. And um, you can make as many as you want. You can do a series. Uh, I am doing a series of 10 today. I'm going to show you the one how it works. The other ones are exactly the same. They just turn out to be a little bit different. So we're going to get going. If you like this type of video, please hit like and subscribe. And just so you know, the next video, I'm going to be showing you how you can create a light ultraviolet chart for your cyanotype prints. I'm also going to talk about where you can get these products because there's some places Wow, is it ever expensive. And then there's others, not so bad. So here we go. Hope you have a good day. Take care. So I'm just going to talk you through this process. You'll notice I'm putting the transparency, an inversed one, 
down on the paper, putting glass over top of it because you want the transparency to be very, very close so that all the edges are crisp. Now it's only taking a few seconds, but if you watch closely, you can see how the paper is turning to a dark blue. You'll also notice there's a little bug. Looks like it's walking across your screen. Don't worry, that was actually filmed during the process and you don't have to be wor worried about that. There is our little friend walking right across Donald Trump. So then the next part, I'm going to be getting out a black plastic bag. The reason for that is because that print is still changing in the sunlight. So I want it to stop as best I can. I put it in a plastic bag. Here I am. See, you can sort of see how the product is washing off and showing you how it's showing up. Again, it was a reverse image. Now it has come out proper because of the way the light hits the paper through the transparency. There's a surprise appearance by a sponge. What I'm pouring on there right now is hydrogen peroxide. It actually creates a small darker blue tinge to it, but more importantly, it stops the transformation process. So now, uh, because if you didn't put that on and you tried, for example, putting this under a frame, eventually it would disappear in the sunlight or turn all dark blue. So that stopped the process. And there it is there. Let's see a final of it. <laughs> 